Hey, how's it going? This is Ron, and welcome to the Standing Wolf Archery Channel. Our guest today is a legendary bow hunter. Uh, if you're familiar with him, you're definitely not going to be disappointed. He's bringing the goods today. And if you're not familiar with him by name, don't worry. Sit back, relax, and enjoy, because this man has done almost everything possible in traditional archery bow hunting. I mean, you are going to be absolutely floored with some of the stuff he's just scratching the surface with with his stories. <laughs> uh, if you guys haven't done so, please like and subscribe. We really appreciate all your support. And without further ado, I'd love to welcome Monty Browning to the Standing With Archery Podcast. Hey, how's it going, everybody? This is Ron from Standing With Archery, and welcome to Bush Stories. We got a phenomenal guest with you guys, loaded with stories, loaded with experience, <laughs> legendary, legendary bow hunter. <laughs> we got Monty Browning with us today. Monty, it's such a pleasure to have you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, it's always humbling to me that people would actually ask you to tell stories like this. I, I, I don't totally get it, but, but I've... Uh, but I appreciate that. I mean, I, I'm humbled by that. That's, that's good. Thank you. Well, I think, you know, with the, as time goes on, hopefully people still continue bow hunting traditional. But right. I think they need to be inspired by people who've led the way, paved the way, you know, made serious accomplishments in, you know, in the sport and in the, in the art and craft of it. And, you know, when you have stories like yours and like other people, too, it's really people are drawn to that people really it's like it really awakens something that's i feel personally myself that's like deep inside deep inside all of us that hunter that provider and to hear these these tales of people pulling off what could be arguably like almost impossible feats sometimes it really it's it's like the tales of old of like it's just really it's <laughs> like the modern day myths almost right uh, well it, to me it's just another day in the bush you know i i just <laughs> done it well, I'll give you I'll give you an example. I got chewed out recently by a, a known bow hunter. Uh, he had read the book and and the Cape Buffalo stories and the bear stories and stuff. And he actually chewed, chewed me out because of my total disregard for the safety of others. Uh, chasing Cape Buffalo, he said. He said this. No, who does that? And. And why would you do that and endanger the professional hunter? I don't know if nobody has hunted with a professional hunter that has 10 rounds of, of 500 grain 458s on his belt and a Winchester Model 70 th that you feel like you're putting in danger. Yeah, okay. They, they're very good at what they do. The African trackers, you're not putting them in danger. You know, they can vanish in a thought. And it just, you know... Um, running at grizzly bears well what else you got to do something and it's just i said i said listen i i said i i apologize if if I, I seem wrong but i said you know i've topped trees for 48 years i i don't think of those things that they right. don't occur to me right and so i'm i'm just still repelling out of ropes that have been nicked and cut halfway through i just repel fast by the cut parts <laughs> and slow down at the ground I mean, it doesn't occur to me that that rope will ever break. It, right. They think that, I mean, Cape Buffalo, of course they'll charge, and of course they're dangerous. At the moment, it's like I said in the book, I forgave my dogs for chasing cars all those years. Now I understand it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't, it, it doesn't occur to me at the time, a lot of times, that something is, is dangerous. And maybe that's, I'm not the smartest guy out there. There's. I've proven that. So I don't know. I, you know, just, uh, but he's the only one that's ever really <laughs> cost me with that, you know? Well, I guess in a way it's kind of a, a unique perspective to someone for someone to actually bring that up. But like, it's like you said, I think when you're in the moment, the heat of extreme danger, you're not really thinking, I mean, in any circumstances, if you're no. about to get hit by a car, you're not thinking, you know, you're, you're reacting, you're doing. So it's exactly. like, yeah. Just think, I mean, well, all I've done, I've done nothing, really. <clears throat> all my hunting feats and stuff that people talk about, I've, I have accomplished not very much. When I compare myself to a guy that's spent a year in combat, 
my dad spent two years fighting the second world war at age 38, you know, uh, 39. And so, um, you think of what people, the, the risk they take every day, firefighters, pilots, you know, um, what I've done is just so mild, you know, by comparison that I don't even think about it. I just think, right. gosh, I right. just had a lot of fun. Well, that's it. That's, you know, that's, that's life. That's what life should be about. Right. That's what we do. Yeah. It's what we do. I love you it. do the same thing. You go out there, you know, you got plenty of bears around where you are. And oh, uh, yeah. you don't go out the back door worrying about black bears, you know, or grizzlies or anything else. It just, I, it never occurs to me that there's a rattlesnake right behind that rock. It never occurs to me. If I hear him, that occurs to me. No, yeah. I, I, I agree. I, I was actually stopped by a, by a black bear a couple of years ago. And I, I didn't even realize it till a couple of days later when I was circling back and following the tracks and seeing it follow me. I was like, well, you, you just don't know. He's yeah. Right. Right. And they're so much better at what they do than what, than we are at what we do in a lot of right. cases. You know, they live yeah. there. <laughs> it's like, you, well, you, you know, I'd, I'd love to, uh, <clears throat> I mean, you've probably jumped in in such a great way too. I love it. It's uh, such a unique perspective and, you know, you got to forget danger. Forget it. It's just if you're going in, if you're going in to do it, you're going to do it. You're going in for the right. to enjoy right. every moment, whatever every moment really is. And you got to accept every moment and the choices you've made. And, you know, it is life. You got to pursue these type of things. Right. Right. Yeah. I agree. How, how did Monty, how did it all start for you, though? Like when when did uh, when did your desire to actually go hunting start? When did when did you actually pick up a bow? How did how did it all begin for you? Because you got such a wealth of uh, such a wealth of experience. So how did it all start? Well, it was weird because, like I said, my dad, my real dad, um, spent two years fighting his way from North Africa to Germany. He comes home. He's he's forty two when he meets my mother, who was twenty two. Hmm. They married, and I'm the second child. But he he was dealing with uh, alcohol the pressures of he fought the war for years and he was going to be a writer and and uh, he was a good writer i didn't know it until i published my first story and i had never written read anything he had written but he was uh, uh you know he was never there from the day i was born and and right. he just come off and leave um and i and i don't hold that against him at all i'm so thankful for the gifts that he gave me and uh, and god has just pushed that forward you know in a great way that I never would have imagined. But uh, so I'm, I, my mom is trying to raise three children and working. And, and so I had, I, I, I kind of grew up feral as Dean Torges used to say. And um, when I was five, my mother, and a lot, so many people have heard this story. It's, it's old hat to most, all the banquets I've done. But when I was five, my mother gave me an, an old second or third hand little bicycle that had training wheels on it. So I took the training wheels off. I didn't figure real men needed training wheels. And uh, uh, some of the archers today take a little offense at that statement about the training wheels. But uh, I took them off. And it's one of those old bikes where you, you, couldn't, you couldn't coast and the pedals, if the wheels turn, the pedals turn. And you just yeah. have to stomp on the thing and lock that back wheel. So I would go down and... and uh, and while my mom was working, I take my little bike down. I, a neighbor had a, a big high hill that went down in green grass. And then there was a creek with high banks. And I would go down and I would skid that bike as close as I could get to the edge without going over, then go back up and do it again. So one day it poured rain, big storm, and the creek was up and rushing. And I go, and I never had done that on wet grass before. So I had to lock the brake down and skid it and never slowed down, went right over the bank into the rushing water. And uh, 20 yards down, I finally dragged my little bike out. So I'm pushing it back to our house, our little house. And and you can hear the sand grating in the chain, you know, in the sprocket. And a kid comes out that lived near me. I didn't know him. And he had a red painted longbow and a couple of arrows. And I saw that bow at age five. And I traded my bicycle right there. Awesome. The <laughs> That's awesome. So I walk in the house and I'll never forget to this day. And I've mentioned this to my mom before she died. I, I, uh, I can remember her pointing her finger at me and she says, where did you get that bow and arrow? And I said, I traded my bicycle for it. 
<laughs> and she's she, the look on her face, you know, because she that was expensive for even a second or third hand bike for her raising three kids. And uh, and and she looked at me and she pointed her finger at me. She said, young man, you made that decision and you're going to have to live with it. And I've lived with it to age 74 and a half. That's great. It's been That's great. Awesome. Yeah. And the kid got the bike with the sand in the chain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and he thought he got the best end of the deal. Yeah, <laughs> that was fun. So from that point, what uh, what led you to start actually like pursuing game? Like, what what was the next step after that? You got uh, at age five, you get a longbow, and like, where where's it go from there? Well, in the summer times, you know, five years old, my mother had two daughters to deal with and and working, and so she could take care of them. But uh, we had a, a we had a a, a, a black lady, Miss Willie Douglas. I'll never forget her. I love her to this day. She basically raised me, and and she was she wasn't very tall, you know. She's a little bitty woman, so she'd sleep in in my room during the week, and and uh, of course I'd I suppose take a nap, and I'd crawl, I'd put pillows under my covers like I was sleeping, and crawl out the woods and go out in the woods. No, she she fumed over that, and uh, but anyway, so so. I went to uh, my uncle's house, my dad's brother's house for a couple of weeks in the summertime. And he, he put me in charge of guarding the fig tree. So I, I skewered a cat bird with one of those arrows, had him half away on the shaft there and he died. And I was so proud of myself. And I was a hook bow hunter at that point. Then I went to my grandmother's house for the weekend, my other grandmother. And there was a cat bird in a china berry tree, and I hit that one, killed it too. Went running in the house while they're frying chicken and showing them that. And he was still alive. His beak was open. He was dying, you know, his tongue sticking out. Pathetic little thing. And uh, and at that point, I just uh, I had never heard of a grand slam, but I was on my way to kill it. I, I had studied and I drew birds because I was artistic and 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 I knew every state bird and and I had memorized those. And, and I, so I had decided that I was going to kill every state bird with my bow and arrow. I just never could figure out how to get out of, you know, Waxhaw, North Carolina, you know, to get to where all these state birds were. But I guess that could have been one of the first grand slams. The bird grand slam. Kill, <laughs> kill every state bird in America. I'm glad that didn't happen. My grandfather heard wind of that. I told him because I I was trying to kill a cardinal, which was a state bird in North Carolina. And he... Uh, he took me in another room and taught me the ways of the Lord a little more, more mm. efficiently. Yeah. Mm. So I gave up on that. But that's where that's where it started. That little longbow and two cat birds, and I was on my way. And after that, it was game on for whatever yeah. it was. Wow, that's incredible. That's but I didn't that. have a dad, so I didn't I, I wasn't actually able to hunt until I actually was in high school and got a job and I I I, I bought a recurve bow. And uh, and then I was shooting it and trying to deer hunt. Didn't know anything. Didn't have a never had a dad to take me hunting or fishing or camping or anything. And um, uh, and I didn't actually kill my first deer until uh, I met some guys up here around the Clemson area when we moved up here when Annie and I got married, 1970. And they were bow hunting at Bear Island off the, in the coast of South Carolina. And invited me to go there, and that's where I killed my first deer in 1972. And that was with like a 40 deer ago. With the recurve you bought. Mm -hmm. mm. And I, I ordered a uh I I had I had I had start we'd bought a Andy and I had bought a lot out in the country, and I was cutting pine trees and I sold pulp wood enough to buy a 1972 magnesium riser bear takedown because my oh, nice. brother. And my, my mentor was shooting a wood handle bear takedown, but I couldn't afford that. But I bought a, a magnesium handle. And as a matter of fact, it's I'm still shooting that today. That right That's there. incredible. Um, and um, but it, it's uh, that bow is still so far ahead of its time that, in my opinion, there is nothing on the planet any better than that right there. It just shoots where you're looking. Yeah, they're they knew what they're doing for sure. I mean, just oh, especially with the takedown, the introduction of the takedown is just genius. Yeah. 
And I've shot longbows. I mean, I went through, you know, after I killed a deer, then you kill another deer. And then next thing you're working on your 10th deer and we could shoot, we could shoot five or six deer a year down here, you know? And so then you hunt two or three States. And uh, so then when I went elk hunting with that same 1972 bear takedown in 73, right after I'd gotten it. And uh, these guys invited me to go elk hunting with them. And it was just game on then. I just, I, I was so fascinated with the West um and then i just started dreaming about oh alaska you name it just going everywhere yeah yeah that's awesome the adventure began and you know the only reason i was able to do that is because annie and i had no kids and annie's my high school sweetheart my first date my wife of 53 and a half years now and and we just we just have a ball we're getting ready to go to alaska fishing and but not having kids enable me to uh right after i fell out of the tree and broke my back in 73 right after i got back from colorado the first time um right after that um i started my tree service in 75 because i love to climb and right. i love firewood and stuff and so uh with a full-time job plus running a tree service uh you know you work all year so you go to one or two hunts right not having kids you know as i've told before we've we've spent what would have been our child's education fund and as we got older we figured we'd have grandkids by then and so since we didn't we went ahead and spent their education fund too <laughs> <laughs> well you know just live live a good life right no matter what the situation is Oh, it's been amazing. It really yeah. has. Danny, I can tell you this. Um, uh, I, I was not going to go moose hunting this year because Jim Eckhout was going to go with Brian Burkhart because Jim wants to get his moose. And so I said, all right, Jim, you go with Brian this year. And then next year you're out because I'll be back with Brian hunting in the valley. But then I got to thinking we're coming back from fishing on like the opening day of moose season. And that just really didn't sit well with me in this new book. I, I need another chapter in that. So I decided uh, to go on a solo hunt. Um, so September 7th, I'm flying back to Alaska to be dropped off in the bush for 10 days by myself uh, to hunt moose. And so, I'm assuming it's going to be an epic story to come from it. <laughs> well, it, well, who knows? You know, you, you never know. You know, the wolves are so bad in Alaska right now, especially the part we hunt. Um, the, no one's trapping in that area, and they've stopped the pilots from shooting them from airplanes. And the wolf population is really increasing, and they're just wreaking havoc on the, the moose calves. Right, right. Yeah. So, but anyway, I didn't mean to run that story too long. It just got, <laughs> it just, it. <laughs> No, that, that's, that's no why you're, yeah, it's part of the show. I mean, you got to you got to tell the backstory. I yeah. mean, this obviously led to you, like you're saying just a minute ago, you got into writing and you've obviously written your book, Bow Hunting Passion for Life. And right. uh, for all those listening, I highly suggest you guys go check out Monty's book. So what actually was the deciding factor for you writing that book? Like, I mean, you must have just a wealth of memories. How did you decide to pick and choose what went into it? And really, what was your thought process to, to make it all happen? Well, really, you know, writing for traditional bow hunter all those years, I wrote for turkey and turkey hunting. I had a column in turkey and turkey hunting match because I'm an avid turkey hunter. And uh, so I had a column in turkey and turkey hunting magazine in the 80s. And then I wrote for Western Bow Hunter and Professional Bow Hunter Society, and then Traditional Bow Hunter and, and Outdoor Life, a few other magazines, and a lot of uh, editorials for newspapers. Um, right. And um, so, I, I mean, I write something every day every and have for 50 years almost. Right. So, uh, um, it, it the writing, uh, it, it's, in, it's in you. And and at some point it just has to come out, and it just I, I've uh, I had a picture. I've got a, these little uh, G two pens. I write everything with ballpoint pens. To this day, I've never typed a story, even though I was at the top of my typing class in high school. I just I just don't like computers, and so I handwrite everything. I carry a little ring binder notebooks, and everything I've written has been handwritten in a ring binder notebook. And huh. so I've stacks and stacks. And so Annie has sorted all that out on the computer for me, you know. 
um, uh, we tried dictating to the computer because somebody told me you could do that. And that was hilarious with a Southern accent. You would be amazed how that turned out horribly. So she types it all out and, and we do that. But uh, it, it, I, I can remember when I was a teenager, just walking through the woods, squirrel hunting, when a really frosty, freezing day, you know, and hearing the leaves crunch. And I was trying to figure out what words you used to describe that sound, mm. the shuffling of the leaves and things. And, and it's, it's a, it's a process, it's a learning process for writers. And I've tried to help some young writers and, uh, you know, and just trying to, to uh, help them draw a picture. Yeah. So as we were saying about the, uh, the, the writing for your book, uh, the, you're uh, saying, yeah, you're saying that you have the, you do everything with, uh, with, with yeah, yeah. That's, that's where I last heard you. Yeah. There, those, those, uh, G2 pins have, uh, 3,500, they average about 3,500 words. And that's about a standard, uh, long article. Uh, I had seven of those empty ones lined up on my little table out here. I took a picture and sent to somebody to show them my technology, you know, um, so, uh, but yeah, you know, that's what we do. And, and I've always done it that way. So it's slow, but it works. And then, you know, I can carry it um, to Alaska. Like this new book, I, I, I wrote it. I started on sitting on a ridge in Alaska and finished it sitting on the same patch of grass in Alaska a year later. And, uh, but this solo hunt, I'm thinking about one more chapter to throw into the end. So this solo hunt hopefully will give me some words for that. Yeah, well, best of luck on that. And hopefully, you know, everything comes together where, you know, obviously it's a safe, successful hunt, but it's a memorable one, too. That could be put into uh, put into words very nicely. Uh, well, yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, coming from uh, from the book, you got obviously a ton of stories, nonstop stories coming at us. And like like I said before. Uh, a lot of people have spoke, spoken very highly and had some personal favorites that they suggested I ask. And uh, because this is is Bush stories, Monty, right. it's time to time to dive in, time to dive into these stories. And one thing that I think uh, I'd love to hear about is uh, the Cape Buffalo hunt, because like we just talked about a moment ago, you had some slack about that. But I'd love to hear hear right from the beginning, like your point of view and like the, what made the hunt so memorable. Well, I had a. I had a friend that I was shooting recurves and stuff. And I, and when I fell out of the tree in 73, I didn't think I would be able to hunt a, with a regular recurve bow again. I had my bear takedown. So the, the bear, bear compound was coming out. They had the same riser recurve limbs. And uh, so I ordered one of those and I shot it for several years. It was amazingly a deadly tool. I, I just hope that the wildlife people wouldn't figure out how deadly that thing was and make outlaw them or something. But I was up to the archery club shooting one day and I was I was becoming disenchanted with it because it was just too easy. Right. And uh, uh, if you saw it, you could kill it just about within bow hunting range. And so uh, shooting marmots at 52 yards and, you know, that kind of stuff. I shot a Pepsi can with 110 yards with that bow one day. Jeez, for a that's, so, that's ridiculously far. Well, it was. And I, I probably couldn't do it again with five dozen arrows. But that particular day. It, but, but that's just kind of the, how accurate those things were. But but anyway, so I, I'm walking around the Archer Club by myself shooting. I'm disenchanted with the bow. And I run into a friend of mine who had a Howard Hill longbow and a back quiver full of brightly feathered arrows. And I, I saw that and the, just the vision of that. I just said, hand it here. So he hands me the bow. I pull an arrow out of his quiver and there was a deer target out there. It was a paper target on a bale, and I pulled that thing back, and it was the, the all the natural came back, just like shooting cat birds. Oh, no, yes. I went back. home, zipped that bow up, and ordered ordered a Howard Hill longbow, nice. sixty pounds, and started shooting it. And I was just amazed how well it shot. And I was just so then I'm reading Howard Hill stuff and Bob Swinehart's, and I wanted to go to Africa anyway. And I wanted to hunt Cape Buffalo and dangerous game. I just, I, from almost from day one, uh, dangerous game really appealed to me. Right. And I know a lot of the guys hunted that stuff 
uh, Fred Bear and Ben Pearson and uh, Howard Hill and Bob Swinehart and all these guys. But the majority of bow hunters didn't. And I didn't want to be like everybody else and just rack up a bunch of big buck deers. You know, yep. and I wanted to go and adventure around the world and, and hunt things with, with Howard Hill longbows and heavy arrows and just hunt dangerous game. And that was my driving force from then on, from that first arrow out of that guy's bow. I buried him last week, uh, unfortunately, and yeah. uh, spoke at his funeral. And after the funeral, I took a I took a deer skin, a package wrapped up in a deer skin with leather ties. And I spoke over him and how he had influenced my life. And at the end, unwrapped the thing, strung up a bear takedown and shot an arrow out of sight. And that brought on a wave of tears. Mm. But that was the best thing I could do, I thought, just to honor him. Yeah. But the but the Cape Buffalo, you know, the, the problem was you read Howard Hill stuff and he's shooting 90, 100 pound bows and Bob Swinehart shooting 90 and 100 pound bows. So I just had to order a 90 pound bow to start preparing you know for a cape buffalo hunt that i didn't know when it would happen in uh, 1983 i went up union grove north carolina to uh, the big traditional shoot up there i was the only guy with a longbow out of a thousand archers that was 1982 uh 82 and and, and i met a guy there that was booking african safaris and I remember this is a funny story. I, I I remember they uh I had the only longbow. There was a guy there with a with a big horn recurve with big brown and white banana cut feathers on them. And he had the only recurve. I had the only longbow. People didn't even know what they were. They were so all compounds. And so they had a, a novelty shoot. They had a, a McKinsey target out there about 45 or 50 yards. And they had a big crowd of people. So my buddy and I signed up for that. He was shooting a compound, uh, Richard Boss from North Carolina. He was shooting a compound. I was shooting that 90-pound Howard Hill longbow and and like 1,400 grain arrows. Wow. And uh, getting ready for to hunt, you know. And, and so this guy comes up to me, dark hair, you know, young, young guy like myself then back in 82. And he was shooting with another guy. And so I shot and I hit that deer target way out there in front of all those people it was a it was just an amazingly lucky shot but it just dropped right in there and hit it everybody cheered you know and this other guy shoots and he hit the target and we talked a little bit had no idea who he was just a few years before tom parsons died i ran into him down in georgia at the Georgia traditional down there. He said, Monty, you remember the first time I met you? And I said, no, Tom, I don't. He said, you remember Union Grove, 1982, the guy with the big horn with recurve? And I said, yes, sir. He said, that was me. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> and I've known Tom for years. And that's the first time he'd shared that story. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So uh, so anyway, I, uh, I met a guy there that was booking African hunts in South Africa. So I signed up. Came home, told Annie, I said, guess where I'm going next year? She said, where? And I said, Africa to hunt with a longbow. And she says, that's great. She has never complained about my hunting, not one time. You think I won't cook for a girl like that uh, and uh, wait on her hand and foot? So uh, so that's kind of how that started. And then uh, once I got to Africa, uh, to South Africa, of course, these are planes game hunts, you know. Uh, and I begged a professional hunter. I said, can you figure out how I can hunt with a longbow over here for Cape Buffalo? And they just couldn't do it. It was illegal. Right. And eventually, uh, 1990 came along and I heard about a guy down in Mozambique. Uh, they had the, the Rhodesian Zimbabwe war was over. And, uh, these guys were, there were bush soldiers and they had been down to Mozambique fighting. So they knew this country and they knew the game. And so he started a camp. I got in touch with him and went down there because Mozambique, they don't care what you do. Right. Yeah. And so I went down there and hunted the first time, 1990 in old Africa, the, the old Portuguese roads were still mined, the plastic mines, they hadn't found all of those. And so, oh, wow. 
the trackers would say, oh, so-and-so was buried here, stepped on a mine, so-and-so was buried here, you know. A lot of trees had grown up in those old roads, so we just, we drove the, the two-track that goes down by the river that they had put in, and we walked game trails, you know, because uh, you never know where the mines are. Yeah, no kidding. But these guys knew the country, and, and it was just phenomenal. Wow. That's intense. So how did like from there, like, where did they, was that the hunt that they took to Cape Buffalo? No, no. I, <clears throat> the first hunt um, the guy I had was, uh, he only hunted with me for a few days and then he had to go off and, and, uh, and guide some African sheik somewhere in, in Africa. So, um, uh, so they brought in a young guy um, and he and I hunted Angelo, Angelos, he and I hunted together. And um, we just, oh, we had a ball because he liked, he liked taking risk and stuff. And he was the guy, um, I shot a Cape Buffalo like day two. Uh, huh. Paul, Paul Kruger was the professional hunter that I had. And uh, we, we circled around some buffalo and are coming through the brush. And I'm shooting 90 pounds with a 1500 grain fish arrow with a two blade head on it. And, uh, and I was shooting pretty well. And so these, this big bull comes out at like 38 yards and he steps out of the brush. And this guy, I'm down on my knees, uh, one knee and, and, uh, and, and watching this animal. And, and he just growled at me. He says, shoot the bugger. And I, I, man, that's a long way. So I just picked one of those bulging muscles and I just pulled back and let that arrow go. It looked like it was going to go four feet over that Buffalo's back. And at 38 yards, it dropped in right behind the front leg but unfortunately, he hit one of those big ribs with the broadhead might have been turned horizontal. Uh, and, and I got about, I probably got 12 inches of penetration. And it, it went crashing out. I mean, it was a beautiful shot. Big yellow feathers hit that black animal, you know, right behind the front leg at 38 yards. Boy, he, and that thing took off and he, jumped, he jumps up with the 458. And I said, don't shoot him. He's good, you know. And so he pulls the muzzle up and he doesn't shoot. So we go down and we start tracking. And we tracked that animal from 10 that morning nonstop until 3.30 that afternoon. Jeez. And went miles. And uh, finally, the arrow, I'd use hot melt cement because I didn't want that broadhead arrow to get stuck inside that rib cage yep. and and i guess the body heat warmed it up enough that heavy arrow flopping 1500 grain fish arrow shaft it just dropped out and we found it and uh and i said paul we that's just one lung and that's not going to kill that animal and after after we tracked it that far it got back with the herd near the river the zambezi river and he declared it healthy and okay he said he'll wow. that one will make it He's thinking more about mating than he is dying. So he Jeez. said, we'll continue the hunt. So we hunted to the end. He left. He had to leave. So I hunted with Angelo, and we had some great things. So right toward the end of the hunt, I haven't gotten another shot. And toward the end of the hunt, late one evening, we're in the brush, and we're following this herd of buffalo. We've been tracking them since gray light that morning. And we just never can get in there close enough to get a shot. And, uh, and Angelo is good with the bow. And so we get in there. And so Angelo says, uh, he says, Monty, um, we're not going to get on these buffalo now. So would you like to just walk up to them? And, and it's, I'm, I'm, I, I don't understand what he's asking me, you know. And, I, and we're behind him with Pony Trackers. And the tracker's right behind us back here. And, uh, and it's starting to get dark. And, and I said, please, yes. He said, sometimes late in the evening when the light is dropping, you, know, you can just walk slowly up to them. Would you like to do that? And I said, I'm thinking 13 days I've been crawling across this country on my chest, pushing with my toes, trying to get close enough to these things. And now you say in the evening we can just walk up to them? And I said, yes. And so he's so he, he opens the 458 and he checks it and shoves the, the, the bolt back down takes the safety off and, and he steps out from the tree. Well, I put an arrow on the bow and I draw it a couple of times and loosen up some muscles. And, and, uh, and I step out behind, he says, he's whispering, he says, do as I do. And the Buffalo were standing there 40 yards away. When we step out from behind the Mopani tree, I'm taller than he is. And so we just start walking toward him. Well, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. 
And so we're walking toward these things. And now, now we're 30 yards. And I haven't crawled an inch. We're walking toward them. And the, I mean, the light's failing, but we're, I can see them. I can see this big bull back in the back, back there, walking to left to right. And that's where I want to put an arrow. And so we get up to 25 yards. Now they're turning their head, looking at us. And when they, when they look at you, when you're on the ground with them, it looks like they're looking right at your belly button because that's about where they're going to hit you. And, and so now we're 20 yards, but there's cows and calves and there's young bulls, but that big bull is on back here. And, and so we get up a little bit close and all of a sudden one of them turns around, hits his horn into the rib cage. And when they start off running through the Mopani trees and, and the Combretum scrub, and it's just a dust cloud. And, and so Angelo says, now, and he takes off running, and I'm running right behind him, and I can outrun him, but I'm right on his heels, and we're chasing these things down in the valley and up the hill and through the, the thorns and getting all scratched up, and it's just great. And we finally, they outdistance us a little bit. Now it's getting too dark, and I can't tell which bull it is or what, and, and they outrun us a little bit and, and go over the next hill. And so he pulls up, and we're both all sweated up. We've been out there all day, and I cannot wipe the smile off my face. And he has just taught me something that I like. And so the hunt is over, basically, and we go home. So I go back the next year, and I'm hunting with him again. And so we get on some buffalo, and, and uh, they're laying on top of the hill up here in the Mopani trees, and we're sitting there glassing. And I said, Angelo, I said, I – it's not working with you and me and the trackers. That's too many people. I said, right. just, just let me go up there by myself. And he thinks about it for a second. And he says, he says, okay, monkey, uh, you must be careful now, but go, you go and we will let you go. So I, I check the wind circle around, run up as close as I can get. And I'm 75 yards from, I drop down and I'm crawling through the grass on hands and knees with that long bow. And I get up there and now I'm 40 yards from them and, and getting lower and lower. And I get up there and there's a row of dyrospirus trees that are about the size of your wrist. And there's a whole row of them. And, and the neat thing is that that's one of the trees they use to make bows there. Oh. The, the, they just do, the dyrospirus. And there's a row of those like gel bars. And behind them, I can see, I don't know, maybe six big bulls laying in the grass. And so I'm crawling. I'm just low crawling. I got my chin right down the ground. I'm shoving the bow up in front of me, and I crawl up there. And now I'm 25 yards, 30 yards from them. Now, that's a big animal. But I can't figure out how to – the tree stop right here, and that's about where the first one is. And so I'm sitting here looking at them, and I catch something out of the corner of my eye, and I look over here, and right behind a Mopani tree, a big buffalo head sticks out from behind a tree, and he's looking at me. And when you're laying on your stomach – you're looking up at them. And I and I never moved. And eventually he just turned and walked away. And I said, oh, that's good. And so I'm sitting there talking to myself. I said, all right, Money Brown from Central South Carolina, you, you've come this far. You got to do something. Yeah. And so I had this plan. I got an arrow on the string. And I said, I'm going to stand up. That's the only thing I can do is stand up. And when they jump up, they'll take one step forward and I'll get a shot at this one. And when I stood up, they wheeled and crashed out of there. They didn't, they didn't take one step forward. And when they did that, something clicked in my brain. And the next day I jerked the arrow off the string. And I got the bow in one hand. I'm holding the broad head up and I'm chasing them as hard as I can go in those stalking shoes. And we went over that hill, down in a valley, up the other hill, across a big flat. And every time they'd jump through a bunch of briars, uh, thorn trees they would stop and look back and i'd bust i'd just throw my hand up to take my eyes and i'd jump through there and when i come out the other side there's a wall of cake buffalo standing there and they would before i could get an arrow and pick one they're running again and i chased them like that for at least three times and then finally i made a bad decision they stopped on the other side, when I busted through, they're standing right there in the open, and that big bull was right there broadside, and before I could get an arrow ready, he turned to go, and I said, I can put it up his hind end and run this thing with 90, I'm, I was pulling about 95 pounds, 
I can put that 1500 grain arrow all the way up to his lungs through there. Huh. And I was shooting well, and it's just a bad decision. And I shot, and I hit him just to the left of the center, got into that hind quarter, and the arrow went, nothing but the knock was sticking out, and blood shot out, and he took off and, and went over the hill. You know, I, there's nothing else I can do. And about that time, I hear footsteps, and Angelo, I look back, and Angelo's in the air jumping over this last bush with the rifle. He runs up, and you can still see him. And he said, did you hit one? And I said, that one, because I don't know what that arrow is going to do. I know yeah. it'll kill the buffalo, but I don't know what the outcome is going to be. And I, I've got to tell the truth. And so he just goes, bam, just like that. Well, I, and how could he miss, you know? The thing was 75 yards away running. As it turned out, all he did, he grazed the top of the back, the arrow, the bullet went in the hide and came back out again and did no damage. If we tracked him down, now in my mind, it's not a bow kill anymore. Yeah, and I'm sad about it, but it's I made the I made a bad decision, right? Uh, and so uh, we we tracked that bull, and he was bleeding good. And I'm thinking it's from a bullet hole and the arrow. As it turns out, it was just from the arrow. And we tracked him a mile, probably a mile. And about three that evening, we jumped him. And he took off running, and Angelo shot. Well, I think he's hit him again. I can't see him. I'm standing on one side of it, and the thing's running. So we take off running. I'm running as hard as I can. All of a sudden, I tripped on something. My head hit the ground. When I came to, everything's swimming around, and I can hear him shooting. Boom! Boom! And, and I'm missing the fight. So I picked my arrows up, stuck them back in the quiver, and took off running. I got a scrape across, bleeding in several places. And I and I chase down and I finally catch up with him. Boom! He shoots again. He's missing every time because the thing's running, you know, and or he's hitting trees. I don't know what happened, but as I ran up to close to him, I could see the buffalo broadside, and he shot him in the neck and broke his neck with oh. the last round he had. Yeah, and uh, the thing collapsed and. It, it, when it went down, I just ran past Angelo and I ran up on him. <laughs> I had a camera. I wanted to get a picture of that. I ran up on him so fast. I actually had to jump over the Buffalo to keep from tripping over him. And uh, so anyway, I, I got a really neat picture of him looking up. Like if I could just get up from here, I'd kill you, you know, and they would, but uh, it was, I couldn't count it for a bow kill, even though the arrow would have killed it. Um, and so then I had to go back again and eventually I, I, uh, the story with, with, uh, Mquevo, the, the native tracker. And I went in the 10 yards ball story and I mm. finally put an arrow right through the center of the heart at, at 10 yards and he dropped it 60 yards and it was just amazing. Wow. That's incredible. Uh, but it was the, and, and see between those incidents, I, I slipped off and chased him again a time or two, and I got myself in a little bit of trouble. But the neat thing was, we get back to <laughs> the Angelo's about had it with me, you know. And the the last one I chased down, the herd I chased down with him, it it was almost dark, and I went up and, and he he and I, I said, let me go by myself. So he said, okay, but no chasing, be careful. Okay, so I go. You know, I start walking into them just like he and I did in the start and they start running. Well, it's getting dark and I took off after them. And I mean, I'm, I don't have him slowing me down. I'm on them. I'm 20 yards behind them running in a dust cloud and tearing through the thorns and stuff. And I finally ran them to a stop. And when I busted through the last thorns, I knew something was wrong because it was quiet. And when I landed and skidded to a stop and that kind of like a pea gravel sand stuff, there's a wall of black buffalo stand there and it just, there's dust in the air and it's just amazing scene. And it's like, uh-oh, they're like a dog. You know, you find the car stops. You know, what are you going to do with it now? And I cannot, I can't pick a bull out that I can get an arrow to. And so I'm standing there looking and they're all looking. There's two dozen of them. They're staring at me. 
And I hear Angelo whistling back here in, in the Mopani trees. And he, I know he's going to be mad. And uh, so I, I just took the air off the string and put it back in the quiver. And I, I turned around and, well, I walked backwards for a ways, just keeping an eye on him, and then turned around and started walking away. And I, you know, you, you say stupid things like, I'll deal with you tomorrow. Like I, <laughs> like I, was, like I could, you know, and I, well, I really couldn't. I didn't even know where I was. And so uh, if he'd have said, okay, you got to find the land cruiser, I'd have been in there for a week, you know? <laughs> so we've been walking since first light that morning. Now it's dark and we have no lights and you're supposed to come back before dark. So uh, we get back, Angelo, I walk up on him. He is mad. Oh gosh, he's mad. Well, it scared him to start with because his client might get killed. And the trackers are standing there and, and they, they're looking down at the ground. They want him to look up. He is saying he's walking back and forth with that 458. And he's bamming the butt of that rifle into the ground for emphasis. Monty, you cannot chase these buffalo without this gun behind you. You must not do that. You'll get yourself killed. And then I'll be in lots of trouble and I'll lose my license. Bam, he hit that gun again. And and I got tickled, you know, and I, I, I'm, the, the whole scene is just funny to me. And so and so I'm standing there and I'm drawing figure eights in the sand with my toe acting like I'm subservient, you know, like the trackers, but I'm not. And I'm, I'm just, I'm loving it. You know, I am covered in sweat and scratched up. I'm bleeding in a dozen different places and I can't wipe the smile off. And he'd look up, he'd get mad and he'd hit that gun on the ground again. Then he finally, he, 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 the trackers started grinning and he looked at them and boy, they just wiped the grins right off. And, and so he says, now we're in here three hours from the truck and, and, and it's dark and we got no lights. And walking out of there, it was so dark. There was no moon. I ran into a thorn tree and I, I, I should have had about six stitches in that arm right there. So I get back and we finally get back in the camp, rattle in the camp in that land cruiser. And I've, I've got blood running down both arms. It's dried. I've got big sweat patches. I mean, I look horrible. And I've got my my Stetson Safari hat on, you know. And so we roll back in there, and I know I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. I, they may throw me out of the camp. And so I look over, and I see the, the, the Mopani Wood campfire there, and a couple guys sitting around. They're still waiting for dinner. And and uh, Angelo goes over here, and I see Pete come out, the guy that's running this show, and Major goes over to him. I know he's telling on me, and I'm going to get chewed out i might get thrown out of the camp i gotta do something so i go next to the campfire and i scoop up that old mopani ashes and sand dust and i put it all over the rim of my hat and on the top and i ease that thing up and set it on my head and when i walked around the corner of the dining hut with the gas lamps burning I just took that hat and just swooped it down like that. And all that dust hit the ground. I said, well, I'll tell you, Pilgrim, I've been hunting buffalo all day and I'm hungry enough to eat a bull myself and <laughs> slap it against my pants like John Wayne. And they cracked up, you know. And then finally, Pete comes over. He comes to my tent that night and he, and he sits there next to my cot. Uh, and so, Monte Angelo tells me that you are becoming familiar with these buffalo now. <laughs> and I said, I said, well, Peter, I just, I can't, I, I'm sorry I did what I did. I said, but I'm really enjoying this hunt. He said, it's okay, Monty. It's okay. We like the way you hunt. We like you here. Uh, but you must be very careful because they're very fast when they come for you. And I thought, I'm not getting thrown out of here. And then he gave me like two extra days. He said, he said, your flight's not to such and such time. Your hunt's actually over tomorrow. He said, how would you like to stay in camp and we'll drive you right to the airport, uh, you know, and you can get a couple extra days because Angelo doesn't want to work around camp. He'll go hunt with you. And I said, that'd be great, you know. And so that's kind of the way it went. Wow, that's amazing. Well, they just started not... to love it. <laughs> they, needed, they needed a guy like you for some excitement. Oh, my gosh. We had some fun. We did. But I never, you know, I didn't, uh, we'd, we'd, be, we'd be so far in the bush. I told him, I said, I didn't come here to eat and I didn't come here to rest. I came uh -huh. here to hunt Buffalo and that's all I want to do. And so we would carry a can of canned peaches and a couple of little cookies uh, and the trackers carry some plastic bottles, of water in it. And middle of the day, Angelo and I would sit there, we'd open that can of peaches and we'd get half the peaches each. One day he gets the juice, the next day it's mine. Uh -huh. And that was our lunch. 
And except for one or two days uh, of all those hunts, I was in the bush all day from from before daylight till after dark. Yeah, I was just thinking the most of it. That's great. And it, and it was and it was just <laughs> it was a lot of crawling in the sand. I'll tell you that. It was fun. I mean, was there ever a time, not necessarily in Africa, but like in just in your experiences, like where there was a moment where you thought that it could be the end, like there was a, like, what would be the, what would you say was the biggest scare where you thought like you, you really crossed the line with whatever you're doing? Oh, that, uh, I had somebody ask me one of the first podcasts I did. And he said, so tell us about the, the bear attack. And I said, which one? And he said, Yo, only you Browning ask for a bear story. And, and you have to ask which one you want to hear. <laughs> uh getting between the sow and cub grizzlies on the caribou kill that was i, I thought that was it i was done right there uh, and i was by myself no communication with anybody um uh, two river incidents uh where i got knocked into the water uh at night one one at night and uh and and sweeper coming and knocked underwater when everything was ice and snow the tent, the, the raft was leaking air. My buddy had a little small raft and he was in and I would had the gear in my raft and my raft had holes in it and it was leaking. Um, uh, and, and I, 10 o'clock at night, I'm still trying to get out. It's five degrees. Everything's ice and snow. And that raft folded and I went in under the water. Whoa. In five degree, and you come out of five degree, well, it's 34 degree water into five degree temperature yeah. and that, that was i thought i was done there i thought i was done with with the grizzly charge the, well the black bear charge wasn't a big deal you know he he broke off pretty easy but the, the grizzly in 2018 that i got too close to the kill that one I, I thought i was done there that was that was scary and you know well, it's i you know it's uh People can say, people might think, you know, somebody does something that they think, well, that was a brave thing you did. It wasn't. It just, just you just did whatever you, know, you do. And yeah. Later on, well, you look back. <clears throat> what ahead. happened with the charge? What happened with the charge? Well, the, I had killed that, the big bull that I killed, big bull moose, when I was hunting with Brian in 2018. And uh, um, so, a couple of days later, I want to go early in the morning. I told Brian, Brian's going to his glassing ridge. And I told him, I said, I said, hey, I'm, I've got a 4K video camera and I want to go around behind our camera. I'd never been back up in there before. And I wanted to work my way down that mountain to where the moose kill was, but I didn't know where it was from there. So he said, okay, be careful. You know, I said, well, I'm always careful. And he knows better. And so, so I go. And I've got a 44 Magnum pistol that the hand of the holster clip had broken. So it's stuck in the top of my backpack back. It was a wonderful place to carry a self-defense handgun, you know, back here where you can't get to it. And I had my bear spray, which I'm totally confident of. Um, I haven't ever used it, but I've carried it a lot. And I'm totally confident. The, the numbers are great. I mean, it's like a 98% success rate with that stuff. Right. So anyway, I go back there and I'm I work, man. It's really cold. It's 18 degrees, I think, and it's everything's frosty. And so I work my way up on the hill up there, and I'm looking down toward the the river and the valley, and I can't see the river. It all blends kind of together, and I can't. I'm not sure where that moose kill is from there. And so I I keep working around. There's no wind, but the cold air is dropping down the mountain. So I know my scent is going down here, but in my mind, now this is this is an hour and a half after I left camp. In my mind, the the moose kill is right over here. And I know the bear's on it because the ravens won't land, but it's in super thick stuff. Right. And and I can't, there's a whole big thicket between there. So I don't, I don't know where it is, but I think it's over this way. So I start going down. Well, the sun is just coming up behind me over the rock cliffs up there, and the valley is just yellow with sunlight, and, and the sunlight's working its way up. Well, I just as I walk on that line of that sunlight and I'm fairly close to that line of thicket. I step into the sunlight and I heard brush breaking to my left and I looked and what I, it scared me to death. 
Hmm. That's one of the biggest interior grizzlies I've ever seen. And because he eats so many moose, uh, but he was in midair coming over the brush. He's coming right at me and he's 40 yards coming up the hill. It's just a slight hill, but he's coming at me and he's coming. Every time he hit the ground, the hair on his back, where it's, where it's parted down his back would, would bounce. And the sun was right in his face and I could see the brown in his eyes. I could see the, the, the dark colors in his, in his gums. Oh. And his lower lip, he must have been in a fight with another bear because his lower lip was torn off and it was hanging, it was hanging down and, and flopping. And every time he hit the ground, that lip would flop and flop back up. And and uh, but he's you know, they can run what 30, 35 miles an hour. They can outrun a horse uh for a short distance. And when he hit the ground and every bound he's taken, he's coming. And he's coming strictly for me. Uh, and, and now I realize that's where the kill was. And my scent was drifting down to him. Yeah. It's protecting a kill. So I jerk out. I mean, I'm. It, it's just my heart went right up in my throat. I jerked the bear spray out. And something looks like God put it in my heart. Says, Brian, it's not going to stop him. It'll never stop that size bear right there as fast as he's coming. And the next thing I knew, I had both hands in the air had the bear spray in this hand, nothing in this hand, and I'm charging down the hill. Hey, bear, hey, bear, hey, bear, as loud as I can, <laughs> like an idiot. And and at, at 20 yards, he turned off. <laughs> and back in the brush again. Oh. I'm telling you what, my heart is pounding, and, and, and I'm, I'm looking around. I jerk the backpack off, grab the 44 Magnum pistol out, cock the hammer back in my left hand, and I got the bear spray in my right hand, and I'm swinging that pistol back and forth covering the brush because I'm expecting him to come out any second. I, I, I felt just like Barney Fife, you know, swinging that pistol around. And, and uh, so anyway, nothing happens, and it gets quiet. Well, all of a sudden, a raven starts flying up the ridge over the kill and the raven flies straight up over me does a pirouette right over my head and he's looking down and going up 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 and i'm i'm so nervous that i just said you are a lot of help just like that you know well he flies up and lands in the top of a spruce tree he's got the tree bent over a little bit he's sitting up there going up up well then four more ravens fly up they come up the same way circle over my head like they're talking and they fly now i've got there's a semicircle with five ravens and five spruce trees watching me. I have never seen that. I've been in Alaska a year and a half of days, you know. I have never seen that before. And I said, now that is very strange. I've already gotten down on my knees and said, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for protecting me from that bear. But I'm I don't know where the bear is. So I'm headed back toward camp after seeing these ravens. I finally get back to camp. And Brian and I have these little walkie-talkies. We just turn them on every hour. Everything okay? Yep. Yeah. All right. See you. Talk to you in an hour. The wildlife people say to do that. So it's okay. And, and uh, I can't talk to him. I had just talked to him right before the bear charge. So I'm walking back. I made a pot of coffee, and I drank the entire pot, walking back and forth. You're trying to figure out what in the world just happened, you know? And so Brian calls in, and I told him, I said, hey, I told him what happened. He said, I told you to be careful. And I said, well, I am always careful, you know. <laughs> so he comes back at lunch and we're standing there in camp and, and I tell him the whole story, you know. <clears throat> and he, you can see the concern in his face. And then all of a sudden he gets this little smile, which is typical Burkhart. And he says, I, I know what the bears, uh, what the ravens were saying to you. And I said, really? And he said, oh, yeah, I know what they were saying. I said, what were they saying? He said they were saying, get back in there, champ. You've got a gun. You can take him. Go ahead. He thinks all our food won't let us eat. You know? <laughs> Brian's a he's a hoot in camp. He's a you you gotta watch that guy all the time. He'll 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 drop two arrows out of his quiver and then walk into camp because he knows I'm what counting his arrows, you know. Hmm. Did you get a shot? He said, Yeah. So you shoot a moose? He said, Yeah, I shot a big one. Did you really? He says, no, I just dropped two words. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get it. Oh, I love it. Wow, that's so intense. I mean, yeah, Lord, de Lord was definitely on your side that day. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it, and that, it, it's been, an, it's been a lot of things. That river, 
that river thing uh, was one of the weirdest. I mean, you got time? Yeah, we got time. My buddy and I, uh, Bob and Carol from Michigan, he and I, we would fly over our area, which is six miles up beyond where Brian hunts. And uh, there's no place to land anything up there. So we'd just throw our gear out of a, a super cup and let it fall down through the trees. And then we'd, what we couldn't throw out, we'd carry on our back and hike up there and throw a raft out into the, in the pond, beaver pond and Bob's little raft. And so um, <clears throat> his raft, his raft is big enough for him and maybe a backpack or something. And it's real maneuverable. So, uh, we get we're up there and we had a, a storm came in, dumped a bunch of snow, like 48 hours of snow. And then we got seven inches of snow, it was down to five degrees. <coughs> oh, excuse me. And uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> All right, three times the charm. Yeah. So uh we're trying to get out of camp and we've got seven inches of snow. We have to, because some trees across the river, we've got to haul our stuff half three quarters of a mile through the snow down to where we can actually get in the river. Right. So we get all that done. Well, we need to be on the river by 12 to two. Well, three o'clock, we finally get all our stuff down there. We've been going since first light. And so we, we get everything ready. Well, I, <clears throat> I open the raft up for the first brand new raft and I unfold it. Well, it's so cold that it, where the tight folds were, it cracked six holes like you'd stabbed them in there with a sharp pencil. Whoa. And every, in every chamber, had we had six holes in there. We had three patches. Bob had ripped his waders, so we used a couple patches for that. And so he, and I'm trying to pump it up. You know, we got to get on the river. It's going to get dark. We got six miles to go. It takes six hours to get down there. And uh, we want to get to that lower camp where, where Brian and Kevin were, you know. Yeah. Um, so we, <clears throat> it won't pump up. So we find the holes. And uh, so I get out, I get out the cement for the patches. And it says, <clears throat> uh, for inflatables, allow 24 hours before use. And I said, we got 15 minutes. So we got our, we got our little gas burner, you know, we lit it up and warmed up the vinyl on the raft and it put the, cleaned it with some, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, Coleman fuel. Yeah. Cleaned it, warmed it up, put the glue on, put the patches, three patches we had, put some glue on the other holes, gave it 15 minutes, shoved it in the water put all the gear in there and every quarter mile we'd have to stop and pump the raft up again. That's how much it go down. We find, and it's brutal because it's ice and snow everywhere. The water's cold. Everything's there's ice on the rocks and I'm having, because the raft it'd go under if I, if I put my knees on the back of it to try to ride it. So Bob's paddling his and he's making good time. Well, I'm keeping up with him speed walking uh, along the rocks and then I'm having to cross the river here, cross back in every riffle we can find, and then just lead it, lead the raft most places, stop, pump it up again. Well, finally, it gets dark, and we're not even close to the camp down there. And so my raft is, is wrinkled all over. There's no way I tried to get on the back, and it went underwater. And so I told my buddy, and all you can see is that the shine of the the, the with the snow is reflecting a little bit of light, so you can see the the silver look of the water. Yeah, I, I see where it curves around, and I can hear water running hard. And I'm in my mind, I'm pretty sure where I know where I am because I've been up down that river so many times. I think I know where I am, and I know there's a log jam down there, not too far. That's what I'm thinking. And my buddy says, buddy, we need to make that lower camp that night. And I said, we can't make the lower camp. We're going to have to camp here. We've got to stay dry. So he just, he said, let's just do one more, one more curve and see what we break into. And so he shoves off. So now I see a black silhouette as it goes around 100 yards down. It goes around the bend, and he goes out of sight. And I'm standing there with a half half inflated raft full of gear and, and stuff. And, uh, and I said, well, Brownie, you, you can't help him. If he gets into that trouble down there, you can't help him standing here. So I just fell forward in a spread eagle belly flop on top of the gear. 
And now I'm in the current, just down the river I go <laughs> in the dark, not knowing what's around the bend or how I'm going to help him. Yeah. And as I go around the bend, he's out to the top of his waders in the water screaming at me, sweeper, don't go in there, don't go in there. And he throw me the rope. Well, I'll raise up and right under my chest is this water, this nylon rope. And so as I go by him, I'd give it everything I've got and I see it tangle and splash right in front of him. Now I'm on my own, but at least he's okay. And uh, he's screaming at me, sweeper, don't go in there, you know. Well, I know that. We've talked about this whole thing all day. You know, we got to stay dry. We can't take any chances. I'm nice and dry. So I, I, I've got to do something because the logs are coming up and you get sucked under that thing and you will never get out of that. And I raise up and I see that shiny aluminum handle for that paddle. And I, I pull that out and raise up to try to push the raft over to the other side so I can hopefully get a hold of a bush or do something. But when I did that, the raft just folded up. When I just went over the side, head first right into that fast, cold water, black now. I'm talking black. But it's amazing. You you go underwater, and you can hear the water. You can hear the rocks on the bottom as they're turning in the current. And I'm, I'm clawing. I had the foresight. To, I knew we had to have that raft with our tent and stuff. And so I held on to the rope when I went over the side and I'm I'm clawing at the bottom with feet and, and hands and this current sweeping me down and I'm pulling rocks loose and they're against each other. And and uh, I don't know if you've ever been dumped in that kind of water at night like that when it's that cold, but that's a real shocker to the system. Mm. And, and it, it only takes a few seconds before your body will start shutting down fingers everything gets cold and you, you lose muscle power and i'm i'm in my mind i didn't think it would ever going to happen that way huh. and and i'm i'm clawing at the bottom and i can't get a grip on anything and i'm being swept on along the bottom there and i'm fighting it as hard as i can fight it. and it all of a sudden and i know god did this i felt like a hand shoved me up into those rocks Wow. And I, I got a hold of some stuff. And next thing I know, I'm coming up out of that river and I've got the raft. And my buddy's running up the bank toward me and said, I'm sorry, buddy. I said, we'll decide and blame later. We got to fix this. And I pull the raft up there. He grabs my pack and hands it to me. Well, I just in case something happened, I had packed stuff in Ziploc, big Ziploc bags. I had a goose down jacket. I had my head uh, fleece face mask, uh, had pants, shirts, everything dry, socks. I pull that thing out and I sit down on a flat rock and, and I start taking these wet clothes. I well, hypothermia has just got me. I, I can't do anything. I'm shaking so bad. My, I can't feel my fingers. They're so cold. And, and uh, so I get all, I, I get my hip waders off and I get the uh, fleece pants off. And I get the shirt off finally, my jacket and everything is just a mess. They're starting stuff is starting to freeze. And so I get all that off and I reach in my bag. And the first thing I pull out is a goose down jacket. Oh my goodness. I put that on. Oh man, that is great. Reached in there. The next thing is a full fleece head net face mask. Now pull that on. Well, I'm, I'm good to go now. Now I can work on this. Well, I can hear Bob breaking sticks, trying to get some stuff for firewood back in the dark back here. We don't have a light. We don't even know where the, it's in the stuff somewhere. So, so uh, I've got the pants off. So I, I, I get some socks on and then I start pulling up pants. Well, then I get up to here to my thighs and I realize I still got my wet shorts on. And so I start to move to get those off and I'm frozen to the rock. And it just, that just cracked me up. I just, I said, Hey buddy. And he said, yeah. And I said, I need some help. And he says, what for? And I said, my butt's frozen to this rock. And he, he's laughing back there. And he said, well, don't stick your tongue to a frozen flagpole. And then I see this vision of this black and white Christmas movie, you know, that kid with his tongue stuck to the flagpole. And so we're just laughing like crazy. And so finally I get pride off of there and get, get clothes on. And uh, I had some starter stuff, some cotton balls with Vaseline and baby oil stuff in them to light to stuff. I had one click lighter 
in a Ziploc bag that had not worked once on the entire trip, but I just, I'd had it for so long, I just couldn't throw it away. My, my waterproof matches that that thing had gotten torn. Everything was wet, no way to start a fire. So I pulled out that old clip lighter that hadn't worked one time on that trip. I had tried it several times. Bob got the, the gas thing and turned the gas on. It's hissing. And I said, Lord, that's all we got right there. And I clicked that lighter and it lit and it uh -huh. lit that gas thing. And boy, I felt that heat on my face. And so then we threw a bunch of Coleman fuel on the, the sticks he had, <laughs> lit that up. And uh, 10 30, 11 o'clock that night, we get in his little tent with our two sleeping bags and <clears throat> get all covered up. And it's still five degrees out there. And uh, um, we, I had two little bullet thermoses that I'd made some soup out of some mountain house chicken and rice that morning. That was going to be our lunch that we never got to eat. And that's the first bite we'd had since before daylight that morning. And that soup, it wasn't cold, but it wasn't exactly warm, but it was amazingly good. Oh, my God. We floated out of there. Uh, we only had about a mile, a mile and a half down to the other camp. I can remember I had to wait till the sun. Fortunately, the sun came up and it started warming up. We put the raft out in the sun and let it warm up a little bit and held it by the fire until we got it flexible enough to pump it up enough. And when I walked into Brian and Kevin's camp down there, Brian said, what happened to that raft? <laughs> you know. And Bob said, it's a long story. So, uh, and that's just one of a number of times that those river things have just been, I told my buddy Bob one time, we'd both gotten knocked into the river that day and I was sitting by our campfire waiting for the fly out the next morning. And I said, uh, one of my brilliant statements, I said, you know something, Bob? And I said, somebody's going to get killed on this river up here. This thing is treacherous. Huh, and he looked at me for a while and he says, well, you and I are the only two that are running it. You want to draw straws? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. Wow. I mean, the stories are just incredible. And, you know, I'm I'm so grateful that, yeah, you were able to take the time to <laughs> share all that. And I'm sure that's just the tip of the iceberg, too. Well, let, let, you know, one, one thing I'd love to ask you, that one thing I'd love to ask you, because, uh, you know, I've got you on here, but, uh, you know, before we sign off, but, uh, you know, if you were to start back again, maybe this could be something useful for someone who's coming into traditional or starting to want to bow hunt. But if you were to go back and maybe like give yourself advice on how you can improve or if you can coach yourself or any kind of advice you give to someone starting, what would you think would be the best thing that you could, could uh, to share and pass on? I, I think if somebody is, is just starting, say, to, to learn to shoot traditional equipment, they're just starting out, they want to be a bow hunter, and, and uh, they want to learn to shoot a longbow or a recurve or something, the best advice I can give them is find the best archer, the best shot, and, and, and let them tutor them. Mm -hmm. get, get instructions because, like uh, – like Brian, you know, he grew up, we've talked about this before. I grew up, I, I trained my bicycle, that little bow and two arrows, and I taught myself, and, and you just pick up so many bad, bad habits that yeah. you have to fight through all the time. I know one time, Owen Jeffrey and I were talking, and uh, he was down in Columbia, and <clears throat> we were talking, I said, oh, and I said, have you ever dealt with uh, target panic? He said, Monty, every, every man that shoots a bow in past history and the future will deal with some part of that at some point in his life. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've struggled with it, you know, since the seventies. And, uh, but I've come up, you know, I've, I've taught myself how to uh, just make myself shoot light bows until I get my form down. Right. Form is the most important thing. Uh, yeah, that's great advice. Any bow you can, you can pick up any bow and, and, and shoot it well after a while, you'll, you'll, you'll adapt to the bow. And, uh, um, but form and having somebody to watch you shoot because you can't see what you're doing. And right. I would just tell them to get with somebody and, and, uh, preferably, uh, pick the highest quality person you can find somebody mm -hmm. that, that you would want to be like, and, and, uh, that knows, and, and if you find somebody like that, they're more than happy to teach you. 
And I, I don't, I never hesitate, you know, I've taught a bunch of kids to shoot bows and arrows over the years. And, uh, uh, at, at our church, uh, I, I would just, I'd get the boys down there, um, uh, in, in uh, like a vacation Bible school. So I'd get 15 to 20 of them. Then I, I had 35 of these little fiberglass Fred bear bows and stuff. And I, I had 500 mixed arrows. I just put five gallon buckets of arrows in front of them and turn them loose. And, and I'd watch them all. And if I see one having a little issue, I just go over there with him, get down on my knees. Cause they're all, you know, three feet tall. Yeah. and get down on my knees with them and say, all right, now let me show you. Let me show you how to do this right. You know, how do you keep the arrow on the rest when you first start? It always wants to go off and shoot that way, you know, and just sit down with them and just spend the time with them. And I would just tell them, just find somebody that really knows how to shoot well that you look up to and, and ask them to teach you. And they will. Hmm. I know of no traditional bow hunter that doesn't have time for kids. None of them. They've all got time for kids. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's really great advice. Yeah, that's fantastic. If hey, if they can't find anybody, come see me. I'll teach you. <laughs> it's an open invitation, people. <laughs> Listen, we don't, Andy and I haven't had any, we don't have any kids, but God has a sense of humor. He, he put 65 under my care down in Georgia, you know, for several years in a row, you know, at this shoot they would have down there. They say, Brown, you got to teach these kids to shoot. And I'm telling you what. You have a little girl here with her little tutu on and she's just shooting like crazy. And the little girl beside her is watching her and she's crying. So just get down on your knees with them and, and show her how to do that. And the next thing you know, the first arrow that goes good, just, just encourage them and praise them for it. And the next thing you know, they are just slinging arrows like crazy. Yeah, uh, that's great. It's just Oh, it's just neat to watch them. Oh, that's great. You know, Monty, I, I have to say, I, I, been really enjoying this. I've been really grateful that you took the time to, to do this with us and to do this recording with me. And, you know, it's been such a pleasure. And I just really want to thank you a lot for, you know, taking the time. And oh, it's just been great. I've just been so captivated by the story. That is everything. <laughs> we got to have you on again. I mean, you got to be a regular weekly guest. It's so good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That and $2 will buy you a cup of coffee. Huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, anyways, no, before right. Before we yeah. sign, before we sign off, uh, is there anywhere you want people to to go check out, like your website and that? If you want to share share your website or any sort of like uh, information. Well, the, the the book that came out in twenty fifteen, you know, Passion for Life. Um, you can just you just Google up Monty Browning book and it'll come up. Uh, and the new one uh, should be out this winter, um, sometime. We got most of it done. I just the pictures failed on us because I'd used them so much. And I didn't realize that you you lose dimension on the pictures when you use them a lot. So right. I've had to go back and pull out all the camera cards and get all the pictures again. So we're working through that. And plus, I wasn't satisfied with the last chapter. So I'll, maybe this solo hunt will add a little spice to that. I don't know. Sure will. Well, that's <laughs> great. Yeah, Monty, once again, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. And, uh, you know, I hope you, you have a fantastic trip when you get out there in Alaska. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate the, the, the invitation.